Great job, Jeff. Great job, everyone. Give it up again. <laughs> Jeff Fries, Bradley Glenn, Julia Shawhoff, Chris Gonzalez. So we're gonna do a, a, I'm going to do a little panel discussion here, uh, and then we'll take your questions. Uh, and so one of the first questions that, that, that I have, and this is for the whole panel, when you're approaching an app, and again, we're talking about a, a, a rapid prototyping. In some cases, you may have more time. I mean, Bradley, you probably had more time for Decoded, or at least the Fuzz team, than uh, say uh, a Guild Group if there's a flash sale. Uh, but with, with, with respect to the, the kind of deadlines you're, you're getting, I mean, I, I'm sure a lot of people are wondering, well, how do you turn it around through the App Store that quickly? What, what's the, the process? And part of that, I want you to each talk about the whole idea of creating a shell app where you're updating. Because uh, one of the things that, uh, uh, you know, particularly um, Julie and, and, and Chris talked about is, is refreshing the app. You know, the statistics that show apps that really fall off the, the, the wagon and become kind of, you know, the, the digital dustbin stuff. But, uh, you know, the, 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 we've heard the term feed the beast for many, many years, particularly with respect to the web. But it, it sounds like this is the, like feeding the beast on, on steroids. So talk, talk about that issue of both approvals and, and rapid turnaround and, and what it means to keep, uh, you know, pushing content out there. give yourself plenty of time if you're looking to get approval with Apple. Um, you have to follow the guidelines and even if you follow them, they may still reject you. So we generally are, you know, expect a sort of two week um, process, approval process time, but it can go longer or it can go faster and it depends on who you know, what phone calls you can make and relationships matter as we know. Um, that's important too. Um, but to your point about shell apps, I'm working with a, a team of, of, I think I've got of 10 um, developers, most of them iOS developers, probably they would be able to read the angry bird stuff that you have. <laughs> and if any of you can raise your hand, because I'd like to hire you. But um, anyway, so the line starts inside. Out. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> I'll buy you a free drink, a free glass of wine. But yeah, no, um, being able to refresh content within an app. So we have these magazine apps that we call a polish shell, so that in individual issues of the magazine will show up, and we just do basically a push of the content out to the user without having to resubmit. If you can it is um, much preferable and it'll work a lot faster. Than it. What about Chris? I mean, you, you've got, you know, first of all, that's an amazing app. I mean, really, just just tremendous stuff in your demo was great. But that, that's a very hungry audience that you have to satisfy, both in terms of the brands you're working with and, and your user base. And can you talk a little bit about the numbers for Guilt Group? How many users do you have and what's sort of your growth? Sure. Uh, well, just in terms of uh, numbers, we're like Uh, a tremendous amount of activity. So we see like a million sessions a month at this point, which so we see a lot of activity. Um, and so just in terms of like apps that you were kind of touching on this, I think a little bit before when you were talking to Julia, but there's different sorts of apps also. There's ways to think about them. So are you actually um, sort of replicating what you already have in another medium within the app, or are you creating sort of a companion app? Are you creating a whole different experience? So <coughs> car and driver app on your phone, for example, to speak about your product, not mine. <laughs> um, uh, maybe doesn't have all the content from the monthly magazine, but it gives you a different experience that still ties into that experience. Uh, at Guilt, it's really important. It's really important to our users that there be parity across mobile in the site. You don't want for there to be a feeling of, I'm getting something less, or I'm getting a lesser experience. I can't access this sale, or I may not get exactly the same deal on mobile that I might get on the website. If users feel like I'm not getting sort of a comparable experience, or that I'm missing out somehow, they're going to abandon you. They're going to go to their desktop or their, you know, on an iPad also, we sort of fight for traffic between the app itself and the site that you can just go to in Safari too. So sort of maintaining a sense of like parity between, between um, the apps and the site is really important. Uh, that means being really smart about the way you set up your back end, being really smart about the sorts of feeds that you have. Uh, so that you're producing content, like, what is your thing again? Once, using it thrice, like you're producing the content once and then serving it across multiple platforms so you can really take full advantage of it. Yeah. Bradley, I mean, you, you've got an interesting you know, situation uh, working as an, an agency and, and uh, you know, I mean, 
know, different things that you bring to the table, but, but from the standpoint of what you're able to reuse and, and you know, are there hairy deadlines uh, uh, that, that you're getting? I mean, tell us a, a few war stories so that people can understand what the life of a mobile agency producer is like. <coughs> make it bloody. Well, yeah, make it bloody. Um, well, I think, I think the one thing that, um, that you strive to do is you don't, Want to basically reinvent the wheel every time um, you? What we do at Fuzz is we uh, create a, you know a series of what we call code modules. So in other words, it's it's uh, like almost like if I guess in, in perspective it would be like a, a series of sets, which uh, you know if you're working on a film or a TV, which you would then you know repaint, shall we say, for the use in that particular kind of app. So in other words, uh, we're actually doing something for the New York Observer, uh, an app right now for them, and we're building upon uh, some of the other uh, publication apps we've done for Rodale and et cetera. Um, so we're able to, to kind of repurpose that a little bit just enough and, and of course completely change the look and feel uh, and work with the Observer team on that. But you know, we're, so we're, not, we're not just you know, starting from scratch every time. Um, so then that's, that's a very big deal, especially when you're dealing with tight deadlines and, um, you know, people who won their app yesterday. Uh, so, and, and also I, I think, I think the, the app store, just to comment a little bit on that, um, I also think that, uh, there, there are some things that you should be, uh, you know, just concerned about if you're creating app, et cetera. It's like the app store does not like big purchases. Um, doesn't like storing your credit card information unless it's through iTunes. Um, these are just things to, to think about when you're thinking about an app. It does, also does not generally like any open-ended financial th kind of transaction, such as a, a, a donation or something. So if you're working on like some kind of nonprofit thing, you say you can get from one to twenty-five dollars. It's like, well, Apple might just reject your app because of that. So, uh, so that's another thing to, to think about too, as, as you're cre as you're creating it. So. Um, I think that, that covers it. So, so Jeff, again, CNN money, that, that's, it, it, it's, it, that, that's an intense sort of data set that you're working with. And, uh, you know, I mean, that brand's been around for a while. I mean, t tell us what your sort of war stories are, because you're serving multiple platforms, uh, uh, you know, along the lines of what Gilt is, is doing, and, as you said, and maybe even more than, than some of the others on the panel. Well, I mean, war stories have to do with with agencies, not not fuzz, no. but uh, <laughs> but other but other agencies who, who we've used to build apps. We get you know, even though it, it's CNN money, we, we have limited resources and we have limited people, so we have to go outside to some uh, outside developers at some point. And there there hasn't been one case ever that's CNN money and CNN uh, where an app has come in on time and on budget. So. Uh, our, our rule of thumb going forward, if we go with outside agencies, is double the budget and double the time. <laughs> right. Well, the, this is this is reality, you know, right? I mean, Unfortunately. Yeah. Yeah. So, so, uh, you know, we we've talked a lot and we've shown some really great stuff uh, on on the iPad and also some iPhone apps. So, um, uh, whether you know the four step child Android, um, I want to hear what the, the the panel has to say uh, about Android. You know, more devices, some great stuff like the the Samsung Galaxy. Uh, it's just a fantastic uh, product, among other things, and um, uh, really great development languages, you know, uh, honeycomb, gingerbread, all the uh, sweets. So ice cream, right, exactly, ice cream sandwich. Um, so, you know, let's go on down the line and, and see if you can give some insights, and if, if you have none, um, you know, maybe we can give you some, some uh, feedback from other people. So. I love Android. Android's great. Android market's great. I love submitting to it. I love all the data that I get from it. And um, the, 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 the Kindle Fire is awesome. And, and they've already sold six million. Come Christmas, it'll probably be eight million. There's barely any apps in that store. If you have an Android app right now, chances are with a little bit of tweaking, it's going to work for the Kindle Fire. And you get it in that store. And Christmas Day, when everyone opens up their app, their Kindle Fire, the first thing you can do is go to the app store and try and download an app. So if you have any chance of being in that store by Christmas, right. I'd say do it. Yeah. Bradley, what do you think there? Well, I think from an independent perspective, um, Android is definitely, uh, because of all the different devices, because of the different screen sizes, et cetera, I mean, you know, we love the Android as well. We love working on Android pro <coughs> projects, but we definitely, it's, it's more expensive. 
to work in Android. Uh, it just is. You have, you don't have that same curation, um, and and you don't have that same kind of um, the platform that the Apple products give you. So so you you have to kind of. Uh, it, you know, another thing is to consider as well is like the Android market is not curated. Um, there's no one to really talk to if your app doesn't work. Um, so, you know, these are things to, to consider. Um, it's definitely not, you know, you, there, there's a huge market out there and you should, if, you're, if you are developing, generally what we like to do is, is, is we like to work on the iPhone version of your app or the, or the iPad version and then take that, take that knowledge, take that look and feel, et cetera, and then port it over to the Android platform uh, after we have a successful release, et cetera. Uh, that generally works for us. We work out all the kinks, et cetera. But it is, you know, a little bit more expensive process. So that that's our perspective. I think I agree. I mean, I said this before in my presentation. With Android, you're talking about lots of different aspect ratios. So, uh, you know, it's the same thing of design something that's um, really highly usable, you're thinking about usability and navigation. Um, all that has to be redone, you know, for iPhone or iPad, you design it once. So you have that one device. For Android, you've got lots of different devices, and there are subtle differences, and so it does make it expensive in terms of time and production. But, I mean, the truth of the matter is, I think that Android is going to you know, far too fast in terms of numbers and will be soon, if not already, I guess, handsets and, and downloads. It's just going to be, you know, it'll be 80-20. The Apple market, you know, they've got hundreds of millions of credit cards on file. They've got that one-click, um, which I guess they took from, from um, Amazon, but they've got the one-click technology, and everybody knows you put in your username, your email, and your password to buy. And people are trained to do that, and it really works. So as yet, you know, I don't think the Google folks, ironically, have really figured it out. Other, The other ironic point I always make is that Google's, Search engine optimization within their app store is pretty lousy. Hard to find apps. Um, to, to the point that was made earlier, it's hard to. You know, I think they could to, buy a search engine. Yeah, I don't know. What do you think? Um, <laughs> <laughs> they own like you know an entire dam in Washington State to like yeah. Yeah. generate energy yeah. for their yeah. servers. So you <laughs> think? <laughs> yeah, I, just to kind of echo everybody else, Android sort of can't be denied in many ways. It's definitely the market leader at this point. But in terms of apps, um, people on iPhones download twice as many apps than they do on Android. Mm -hmm. So Apple still kind of has the corner of the market on like you know the app <coughs> machine. They make the experience so smooth and so easy. Um, the other thing just to think about, this is very much like a guild group perspective, is you know do the do the platforms sort of line up with your demographic? Mm -hmm. uh, so Androids are sort of starting to become like the default device. It's the device mm -hmm. that you get when you kind of get a baseline account with T-Mobile or whatever else. Mm -hmm. Um, it's a very different user um, from necessarily a demographic at uh, at Guild, where you know, it tends to be a little bit more higher income, uh, a little bit you know, younger, very <coughs> tech savvy in a way. So we see far more traffic um, in our iOS apps than we do in any of our Android apps. Um, some things that some people are starting to do, which is kind of interesting, because they see similar things, just that the app is not as popular on Android as it is in iPhone by large margins is they're starting to develop these HTML5 web, uh, web experiences, which you can then go to in your web browser, and it, it's, HTML5 is kind of awesome. Um, and you're able to actually produce a very slick sort of interface with images that you can swipe, and things that feel very much like an app. Many people are starting to go that route, to develop an HTML5 website, and then just kind of build a very thin, um, uh, app or client for Android that pulls in the mobile web experience. So you're sort of getting two for one and focus on iOS, which is kind of like the still the money machine, even though there's a lot of stuff to cut through. Yeah. <clears throat> so the, the, the next question really gets to something that's been a little bit controversial, uh, particularly with, with Apple. But uh, you know, uh, if, if you're a producer, you're thinking of pushing content, creating a nice shell, looking at HTML5, getting some cross-platform functionality. You're looking at all these things. You're looking at how you're marketing this, what your demo is. Um, and then there's ads, in-app purchases. A um, lot of questions about where that's going. I think that we've seen in the last year uh, that some of those issues have been resolved, particularly with Apple. Um, it, it went to sleep. It's OK. Uh, you know, I mean, between the, 
the, the huge surge, both uh, Android and, and particularly uh, the iPhone ads, as well as uh, you know what we're we're looking to see in terms of both the ads and in-app purchases. I mean, what 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 do you as as panelists? I mean, what what's what sort of your take on that market and how heavily are you getting involved in this? Who wants to take this one? We do both. So if you look at the magazine um, apps, you, it's free to download if you want to download Elle, Car and Driver, Oprah, Esquire, Popular Mechanics, Cosmo for Guys, um, which is an iPad only publication. It, in essence, is a free download, but then all of the issues you would pay for a subscription or for individual issues. And then we love ads, and we put ads in them. And we try to give the user an experience that they like. But Interestingly, we've done some usability testing, what you or I might think is kind of a cool um, ad experience. We found that with some of the ladies' magazines, like fashion, especially fashion magazines, women like to look at ads in fashion magazines. So they complain that they don't have all the ads. So mm -hmm. we try to, you know, do both. Yeah. yeah. Bradley, you want to take that one? Uh, well, I mean, I think, you know, we're starting to, to work with a lot of different people who are, you know, the, the, the pre play app, uh, that is the, the revenue model is ads. Uh, people playing it, they will be serviced with ads, so we're starting to do that uh, more and more. Um, In-app purchasing is also uh, a big, you know, a big portion of the, the, the Jay-Z app. You have the option to, you know, several songs. It, it's, it's a living app, so going to the earlier point of, um, you know, making the app experience, refreshing it, et cetera. You know, you can, you can, they release several songs that are that are now been decoded and the app will of course send you a push notification saying, hey, do you wanna, these new songs have been decoded, do you want to purchase them? Um, and I think you're seeing this more and more, uh, that the app isn't, isn't just the experience of using the app and then that's it. And that's to Chris's point earlier, you know, they wanna create like a real experience with this thing, could establish a relationship with it. And, and we're starting to do that more and more as well uh, with things like the in-app purchase, with the push notifications, with uh, really engaging, uh, in engaging the user on a really a more regular basis. Yeah. It should be noted that Apple takes 30% yeah. of all in-app purchases. Yeah. Yeah. And 30% and of all app downloads also. So does Android. That's right, that's right. So, so the, 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 that, you know, from the standpoint of of where the, the, the innovation is in the storytelling. I mean, I, I think we've seen some really good examples of, first of all, you know, you, the, the work that is being done. I think uh, today, if we had done this panel a year ago, we would have seen a different level of functionality, to be sure. So, uh, you know, not to make predictions, but talk about what you see in the next year, because whether it's HTML5 or it's uh, things like, uh, uh, you know, haptics, um, you know, one of my clients, Sun Sensei, has uh, you know field screen technology. I mean, mm -hmm. this this is this is here today. Um, you, you know, how much of that plays into what you're doing, and are you getting those kind of hey, can you make advanced kind of things from your clients? I mean, you know, it's a talk about you know sort of what's next and what what you're you're thinking. Of. Well, <clears throat> I say a year from now, BlackBerry will be dead. Windows Mobile will have failed, and we'll still be in a uh, Android iOS world. The number one app will still be the browser, and we're going to see a lot more HTML5, but apps aren't going away. Uh, I, know, I know Chris was a little bit of a, a downer there, but I, I think <laughs> I see big things, and I see big numbers, and, and I see huge opportunity, and I, and I believe in the gold rush, and I think it's just going to get bigger, bigger, bigger. Yeah. <laughs> I, I, I'm just going to be very specific, I think, to, to the producing audience, and, and and say that I think um, you know the, a very big growth market will be uh, for for producers such as yourself and, and and us included is the enterprise apps for companies, uh, apps for sales reps, apps for with their own because you know with Apple you have your own uh, you can have your own app store of your company you can release these apps to um, your sales force to your colleagues these can be training modules etc this is remember the old infomercial or um, you know corporate video that people used to do like in the 90s and Industrial. industrials everyone um, you know now the the industrial of today is the enterprise app 
so what you you know what you would charge back then for that that's what your that's what that's the, really the growth is here and it will have video yep it will have video it will have a level of interactivity we'll have a quiz at the end you know et cetera et cetera but that's kind of the the next level um, certainly that that you know it's not just the consumer it's also the corporate client that's using it. I think I mentioned before I'm really excited to see what happens with Apple and television I mean, I think that they've had a pretty good track record. I think all of you, most of you, as sort of you know, TV, film producers, should be thinking about, you know, how are you going to get your content onto that platform? Um, I'm really excited about that. I, I love the notion. I'm one of those people who uses my iPad in front of the TV. And, you know, I'm going to multitask. And, um, you know, there's all these co-watching apps that you can be chatting with your friends while, you know, entering the contest and watching TV. But that's, that's the reality of where it's going. And um, for our stuff, for the magazines, I, I see that there's, right now, you know, I mentioned that there's this sort of dual revenue stream. One is subscriptions or in-app purchases, the other is ads. And I think e-commerce is going to be bigger and bigger um, for traditional magazine publishers as we figure out that maybe unified shopping cart. Chris showed you a nice example of that with his app, but I think that that's going to be the third thing. And then I think, Ultimately, advertisements, they're still being, especially in our industry, um, the CPM model, cost per thousand, and not really kind of understanding, not really looking at an analytics and understanding how people are using um, digital media, because that's not something that print people or even TV people do too much, but I think maybe it'll, hopefully it'll transform um, understanding engagement factors um, and what really sticks with people in terms of advertising. So I'm hoping that that gets transformed somewhere along the lines. So we're not just looking at sheer, you know, volume and numbers, um, you know, and, and huge audiences necessarily, but more engaged audiences and there's value there. Oh man, this is a hard question. Uh, the truth of the matter is I have no idea where it's going to go in the next year. <laughs> it's very hard to predict. I don't think anybody can predict it. It's kind of a mess in a way. Things are just kind of continuing to fragment. Apps are everywhere, now on your phone, on your iPad. They're now on your refrigerator. They're in your <laughs> pen. They're like, yeah, and it, I don't think that there's going to be, uh, I'm not sure if there's really going to be a, quite a consolidation. I think it's just going to kind of continue to fragment and become messy. Um, and I do think that's kind of like where HTML5 has a pretty big chance over the next few years of like kind of stepping in a little bit because it is sort of like cross-platform common denominator and just becoming more and more sophisticated. Um, things, there's really no reason that you have to download the New York Times to your to your iPad. HTML5 can, can do that for you. Of course, there's sort of a discovery issue. It's, it's hard on the web right now to find anything. It's also hard to find things in the app store. But um, I think less and less there's going to be a need for actually like sitting, waiting for an app to download takes all that long, um, and uh, I think HTML5 will just kind of help speak. Yeah. One other thing I just wanted to say is I, I do feel like in, you know, certainly not very long from now, we're going to stop talking about mobile. Um, I don't think we're going to think about it as mobile as sort of being a separate thing. Those of us who've worked at media <coughs> companies know that, you know, mobile tends to be an afterthought or separate mm -hmm. or it's not going to be. I mean, we're just going to be accessing content through whatever device we're not going to think about it as mobile versus web. Yeah, and you, you hit on uh, the, the pieces of my next question, which is really getting to Bradley's point about individual app stores, and not just for, for enterprise, but also, I mean, I mentioned the Warner Brothers, you know, selling films through essentially their own app store, well, it's through iTunes, but I, I mean, the talk, talk about, you know, that, that side of the independent you know, producer <coughs> with all the things that we expect that we know today I mean, and, and to talk about that from a revenues standpoint as well, because your own businesses have seen this. I mean, one of the, the to Julia's point, uh, is that you, you have the breakdown uh, and smashing of the delineation between, say, wired and web, largely because it, the, the revenues there. It's not the afterthought. We used to talk, when was the last time you heard somebody talking about digital pennies? Uh, I, that, that's not the case. You know, everything's digital now. We finally went to an all digital TV uh, infrastructure in 2009. So, you know, a analog is, uh, even your refrigerator is digital. I mean, w what does it matter? Uh, it's back to Chris's point. But I think 
uh, you know, what, what I want to hear is what you're looking at in terms of, of setting up stores and what the revenue sort of projections are there. I mean, you know, what, whether that's internal or, or external. Well, you know, I can only really speak to CNN money right now, which uh, and we have uh, you know, ad models, CPMs, and, and it's, it's pretty easy for CNN money because we stand on the shoulders of giants of CNN, and then we get lots of downloads, but we also have great, great, great creative writers who are doing some of the best content out there, so we get really, really good page views, and it's my job just to make the, um, you know, the engines to load fast and get that content, get it in front of them so we get the page views so we make money. Well, I know that speaking a little bit about um, what we said before about you know creating these code modules, um, I think that there, those code modules will, uh, I think for a lot of companies, you know, and ours as well, perhaps in the future will become you know a, a currency uh, of sort that that you can license to other groups that you can you know say you know you oh you want to build this children's book well we have an engine you know um, and perhaps you know you want to build it yourself well buy our engine license our engine like a software uh, to build that um, that's something that I, I see in the future um, again it's very early on I don't necessarily uh, you know I see it very much in a case by case basis right now but it, it could happen and uh, it's moving in that direction. For the for Hearst magazines and company I'm working for now, I think um, for sure, you know, the, the percentage of the market of people buying subscriptions on digital platforms and that includes all these tablets, including Nook and Kindle as well, because um, we have large like, there's a large female audience, women tend to like the size of the those readers, um, the seven inch fits into your handbag. Um, and so that percentage has increased to the point where they're not you know, sort of saying, oh, this is cute, this is like a little side business, they realize that's the future and it's actually growing to that point. So we're seeing mass, we're seeing scale, um, you know, in aggregate. Uh, so, you know, I think that's where the, the market is going. Um, I, th I think we do this for a living and it gets very confusing. There are a lot of app stores out there. There is a lot of distribution centers. Um, and somebody else on the panel said this before, you think I'm from CNN, we have unlimited resources and unlimited money? No, it doesn't work that way. Everybody deals with constraints. So we choose our battles very, uh, very specifically. Um, our main platforms are iPhone, iOS, Android phone, that's it. For us, Android tablet at this point is still something to be seen. It will happen, yes, but it's still a little bit of a wait, wait and see approach. So sort of choose your battles carefully. You know, sort of make your decisions uh, smartly in terms of where you're, you put your priorities and what you invest in. Excellent advice. So uh, I'm gonna throw one more question to the panel and then we'll open it up for your questions. Um, there's been a lot of talk in the last year about uh, a term I, I'm not crazy about, but it's, 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 uh, it's sort of a term du jour is gamification. Um, you know, obviously games are, are a tremendous part of the quote-unquote app market. Um, talk about your experience with that and, and, you know, how you feel that relates to what you're doing. Maybe it doesn't, but, you know, I just want to get uh, the, the, your, your thoughts on uh, the, the broader kind of mobile game and app market. Well, I think gamification and games are two different things. Uh, gamification is using psychology and, and, and tricks of, of of gaming to get people to use stuff. So, so a simple example is the uh, frequent flyer program, and and that's really a game and how you're just trying to get more and more points and level up and level up and level up and the higher your level is, the, the better <coughs> off you are. And translating those sort of um, mechanics into CNN money, so it can be uh, something like in, in the commenting system, having the best comment, people voting your comment up or comment down, mm -hmm. and and just having that little piece of gamification. Into, built into our commenting system has really given us a lot better comments. So it's not just people saying stupid stuff, it's people who are trying to contribute, who are trying to get voted up, who are trying to win. Uh, we, we've had a similar uh, kind of experience where we, we uh, actually, we don't do, and so we don't produce games per se, um, we do do quizzes. Um, and, uh, and and actually, one of our most popular apps is uh, for Rodale. We did the eat this, not that uh, quiz. Mm -hmm. So that and that's a very, very, very popular app. Um, and and that again, you know, that is I think I would call that gamification of your diet, um, if you want to go there. Um, 
but uh, but so so yeah. I mean, I think you know even even in the Pablo Frida app, we have you know a meat quiz. <laughs> so um, so you know there, that is a big part of, of what you do that that because you know it's what is a game but like a simple level of interactivity. It's like well, that's that's it's like at a very basic level. It's you are interacting with this app. It is a game. You get scored. So there is a certain gamification that is happening in, in a lot of different apps. Yeah, within the magazine apps that we do, I, I showed you some of the functionality with an L where you can swap the different you know, outfits and um, to throw this point about you know, interactivity. I wouldn't say that we actually produce games. We have done some units within <coughs> Popular Mechanics is a good example. Um, there's a Mars Lander test that actually one of my developers built, which is pretty cool. Um, but again, we are in a game company, so we'll have game units within the magazines, and you know, it's a way of, um, you know, again, it's a, an engagement tool, um, and we definitely think about how could we create a game out of the content that we already produce. Um, so you know, we're definitely doing some of those things. Um, and so while Hilt is is a real tailor, uh, I would say that actually gamification has been a large part of our success. Uh, so sort of the whole model is built around competition in a way. Every day at 12 o'clock, you get this little bing on your phone, the drama starts. You're like, let me get in there. Let me gotta rush through the sales as quickly as possible. You start seeing things in members' carts already. So people are grabbing the stuff that you want. Um, we actually limit the cart to five items because people will hoard. They'll take more than, than they need to have. So people will grab stuff. Guilt, guilt group orders. <laughs> I can't let go of my app. Yeah. And then we also put a timer on the card as well. So you have 10 minutes to make a decision if whether you're going to buy that item or not. So there's definitely like a little bit of there's competition with other shoppers. There's a pressure we put on you to purchase uh, that item with you. You don't do that. Do you, <laughs> have, do you have a virtual it's, agent? It's like a red, don't you want that? It's, not like that? A red, it's a red timer that's like counting down 59, 50. Oh, it's in your face. So yes, we're totally pumping up the, the drama around uh, <laughs> that. Um, but you know, so I think that that works really well. Another thing that we talk a lot about these days, especially in shopping, is social commerce. And that's really hard. Yeah, so it's, it's not necessarily easy to kind of like apply these things. And I'm sort of relating it to games because part how do you apply that to your content without making it seem cheesy? How do you apply social shopping to shopping without making it seem like your teenagers hanging out in a mall or something? Um, so not easy. Not easy. Yeah. It's. Um yeah, I mean, and, and some of the things, I mean, I've seen some great apps that have been tied to, for example, um, I mean, um, I, I was working with Skyrocket on the I Don't Know How She Does It uh, app, which was a really wonderful iPhone uh, and web uh, experience, and um, the movie just died. I mean, it, it, was, it was DOA, uh, and you'd think, ah, oh, this is great, you got Sarah Jessica Parker, she'll sell anything, she can sell dog food, come on, she's got that, that Pius Brosnan and blah, 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 and it's just dead on arrival, and uh, doesn't really help the app experience, but they did sell, <laughs> no, but, but the thing is, uh, and it was, it was through a competitor, Outlook of, of Guild Group, uh, but the idea was that you would get daily deals and leading up to the film, and it was pretty innovative, I mean, the Weinstein Company, uh, which puts out great films, that, that was not one of them, uh, but great app, you know, so well, what do you do? You got great content, uh, great app, and you know, it's a, a bit of a companion, and you know, you know, the sink, sinkhole, so uh, that can happen, so uh, it can happen. Question, you sir, ma'am, person, I can't see you. Okay. Yes. Uh, I wondered if each of you can respond if you're seeing this move app move over to education. Like, for tutoring math, I would think that this could really work effectively. And, if and, and, and you're absolutely right. The question is, talk about education. As I mentioned, some of the most expensive apps in the, uh, the App Store, uh, the iTunes App Store, are educational apps. And to Bradley's point, some of them are like bar maxes for bar exam preparation. Uh, but panelists, talk about um, anything that you're doing in education or what your views are on enhancing the educational experience through the, uh, the app market. I'm abstaining from this one. <laughs> uh, well, we are, like I said earlier, we, we are starting to get into more uh, publishing and actually book kind of experiences. Uh, 
we started to, to work actually on, on uh, a children's book experience, so we're, we're working on that. In terms of actual education projects, uh, we're, we haven't, I don't think we've, we've done one um, quite like that, so I, I um, you know, but I know that the education apps are, are you know, pretty pricey, you know, and I, and I know that, that they're, they're getting a lot of traction, so. I can just speak from my past experience was quickly, you know, having worked um, for the independent TV news production company, which was in science, and we had a National Science Foundation grant, so we did have to consider things about, you know, engagement slash education as much as we could. Um, one of the things I did was um, deals with, with uh, textbook publishing companies, and the challenge that they have is that they're selling, you know, a $150 textbook to students, which goes, basically is outdated by the time it's printed pretty much. And so their challenge is getting uh, instructors, professors to adopt these textbooks. And you know, I see a real opportunity if you can come up with what they call the blended learning environment. And that was great for us because we were producing these short form news pieces about science that were coming out every week. And so if you're talking about genetics, well, here's the latest research on whatever field of genetics might be. Um, and you know, those all existed on the web. But you can imagine kids are going to be carrying iPads. You know, schools are going to be giving kids iPads. So yeah, I mean, definitely think about it. I don't have personal experience in the last, you know, it's been a few years since I worked in that area. But you know, again, what I was talking about in terms of working with um, science museums or any museum for kind of bringing content in on handheld, thinking about doing tours, <coughs> all those kinds of ways that you can engage audiences and do that sort of educational content. Um, I think there's definitely an opportunity. So I mean, education is definitely a huge market. And you can see Apple pushing it also in their iPad 2 commercials. It's a lot of like educational, you know, a girl uh, sitting in a chair with her teacher, kind of going through an app. Uh, one of the last apps I made at my last company, Condé Nast, was uh, called Idea Flight, and it was basically this app, and we invented it, we created it for a business audience. The whole idea was business people now have iPads. They're sitting around a conference room table, and meanwhile, everybody's still looking up at you know the PowerPoint up on the screen. <laughs> Why can't you just per, uh, serve the the presentation on the iPad and sync it across multiple iPads? Uh, we marketed it to a business audience, uh, but what we found out was that there was a huge need in the education market for this. Also, many teachers who were writing us asking um, if they could purchase educational licenses. Um, it's another thing to know about Apple. They they um, they will um, distribute apps uh, at a different price for educational institutions. Uh, but many teachers were asking for, and we ended up seeing like this whole other market for the, the app that we never thought existed, but um, you know, there's definitely a lot of need for it. And it's already happening. Uh, students have iPads in schools. It's happening. Next question. Thanks for being here. All, all the insights are so, so useful. Could you talk a little bit about um, process and expectations, so you got your idea, you got your app, you uh, go ahead and start developing it, went through the process of submitting it. What, what can you expect and how do you follow if those results do not meet your expectations? How can you, can you, is there, is there, are there certain general things that you can do in terms of tweaking or, um, or doing that can help you, you know, there's an app for that. Just yeah, kidding. Okay. <laughs> it doesn't feel like you, like you're, like it didn't work. Right, right. So the, the question for those who didn't hear is, when you're going through the process of, of producing and then submitting an app, are there tricks? And Bradley mentioned a few of them, but we'll go through these again. That that you you can know uh, that will help you accelerate the process. So uh, and and then if you might get rejected, uh, what's the experience of getting feedback from say Apple about? How you should improve the app so it can get submitted to the store. But no, no, sorry. <laughs> yeah, okay. It's not about a approval process. It's like it's out there in the marketplace. Are like our users right. using it or not using it? <coughs> what can you do to make yeah, okay. it better? Okay. So like I, internal okay. metrics well, of success. Uh, I, I, it, again, it's it's really it, it's almost more a distribution and, and marketing question at that point. And as some of the panelists have mentioned, it is kind of a needle in the haystack situation. But I want the panelists to talk to this because, of course. That's a big frustration. It's like uh, anything else. I, I, I you know, uh, we busted our butt to create this beautiful thing. Whatever the budget was, how the heck are we going to get people out there using it, or, or, or even giving feedback that makes it even better? So, 
da data is, is the most important thing, and, and having detailed analytics. There's, there's some off-the-shelf packages with Flurry. Uh, I haven't used it. We, we have a, an internal thing that we use. Uh, the company's called Bango. It's also available to anybody else. I make sure you, you're capturing every single click piece of analytics that you can possibly get and build, measure, learn, release, build, measure, learn, release. Just keep putting it out there and keep iterating upon it and keep improving it. You know, you'll see what's working and what's not through your analytics. So really just spend a lot of time combing through your data, coming up with you know, the inferences from what you can get from that, and then <clears throat> push out a, a, an improvement and measure it again, see how it works. Uh, the other thing is um, user usability testing. Actually getting people in a controlled environment with the app in their hand and taking them through a, a script that you already um, uh, came up with to come up with, you know, see how they use the app, to get their feedback, and you know, it, it's a real skill and, and, and there's definitely some really great professionals that, that do that, but it's, it's also something that you can do yourself and just put an ad on Craigslist and get a bunch of people to come and use their app and get their feedback because they're going to show you things you never ever would have thought of in a million years. Um, I'm going to talk about this in two ways. I mean, I think, you know, first of all, just like, I mean, everyone here is a producer, you know, et cetera. I mean, if you, you know, your, your wireframe is your script, you know, is your script good? Is your script, who's your audience? Um, you know, how, have you identified how you are going to get your audience excited about your app? Uh, it doesn't mean reaching out to certain blogs, does it mean, you know, trying to create some partnerships, what, you know, uh, before you even build it. You know, I mean, these are things like the same way you would be trying to get, you know, like financing together for your indie film and try to get into, the, into that festival. It's, it's not that different in terms of getting your, you know, making the calls, sending the emails, getting people involved, et cetera. That's one side of it. The other side of it is, um, you know, if you have the money, there are groups out there who will, uh, you know, who you can pay and they will get you to the top 10 uh, of apps, you know, in the app store and iPad, et cetera. So that's the kind of flip side of it. Um, so, you know, there, there's the, you know, there's the feet on the pavement side of it, you know, and, and really kind of doing the groundwork. And then there's the other side of it, which is like just basically payola. Essentially, <laughs> um, so you know, maybe you want to try both. Maybe you try one or the other. You know, but it's those are those are options that are out there. There are people that are doing that. What is it? What's the company that? Is doing that? <laughs> uh, <laughs> post production, not post production. <laughs> <laughs> we build. Um, we build, and, and we get at our app store references. Honestly, uh, yeah. no. Um, we. I don't know exactly. I, I'd have to. I'd have to look at. Uh, I can certainly send you an email because I know other people. Jump Tap does, uh, uh, or Tap Joy. Sorry, Tap Joy. Tap Joy. Tap Joy. Although I don't Jump Tap does it too. Now. Yeah, I don't know if um, how you know. There's been questions about whether Apple's going to crack down on that. So mm -hmm. um, one thing I would say is just to echo what other folks have said. Um, for sure some usability testing even if it's just like you know your friends and neighbors and you buy them a beer and you know um, uh, we did some usability testing on an app recently and there you know some surprising things we were like my god this is so cool and of course we're so in the weeds and we know the app and everyone's like I have no idea how to get from one part of this to the next like what's this for and they're pressing things and getting frustrated and you know, that's really helpful so do that the other thing is have a mechanism for people to give you feedback in your app and make sure you answer emails. Be prepared to do that. The reason why is because if people get pissed off, they'll you know take it out on you on iTunes, give you one star, and it's a bummer when you know you put your heart and soul and you know all your waking hours into do developing something, and people get pissed off. Now the thing about iTunes is it's totally <coughs> democratic, so anyone can say whatever they want. Um, know that there are companies out there that pay to have people write negative comments on your iTunes you know page um, if they're working for the competition. Um, but yeah, I mean, if you don't have an, a, an email that someone can answer, part of the reason why you want to do that is if someone's having trouble downloading something, they're complaining that this doesn't work, you want your developers to actually talk to those people and say, well, what the heck's going on here? Because unless they are able to reproduce it themselves, they won't know what the problem is. 
So if they can walk through a user who might be having problems with their Wi-Fi and don't realize it, half of us know with your phone, you know, say 3G, 5 bars, and you're like, why can't, why can't you <coughs> dropping calls? Why can't I get on the internet? That kind of stuff is all the sorts of things that you need to know about, so I would suggest highly that you have some feedback mechanism in addition to what the other folks have said. And make sure that if you're getting emails, you know, someone actually answers them because um, you know, Popular Mechanics is great about doing this. Um, they've got a guy who answers emails, and you know, people are like, this doesn't work, and he comes to us and he's like, you know, Joe Schmo from wherever, Kalamazoo, has this problem, we'll contact the guy, and if we can't figure it out, we'll ask him one. It helps a lot. Can I just add something that I think that, that what happened last summer on Twitter is really important also, you know, that if somebody's not getting feedback on, you know, from your app, they're going to hashtag it and just go crazy. Yes, well, that, that was exactly what I was going to mention. But first, I, I wanted uh, one other uh, sort of uh, coda to uh, the question. Students, um, and not to be exploitative, but, um, you know, particularly if you're in a great market like New York or San Francisco, I mean, I've done this with clients where, you know, go to the Coho, the coffee house at Stanford, and uh, it's very honest feedback. Um, you're going to get it anyway once you put it out, but that's a great way to do it. And they may feel, hey, I'm, I'm hip to something that nobody else knows. Uh, it's all part of that greater community, but you got to be careful. And to the Twitter issue, let's have the panelists talk about this because, you know, again, a little bit of war stories, but this is sort of the worst side of what Julia mentioned, which is um, if you don't take care of it, people will take care of you. So, you know. Oh, yeah, I mean, in this world of mobile, you know, one star is the death of you. Half, half a star can translate to, in, in my case, half a million dollars, literally. Uh, and and um, we, we put out an Android app, and, and people talk about, you know, what a pain in the ass Android is and how it's totally different. From, like, every screen is different. It, it's true. It is a pain in the ass. And um, you're going to come up against you know, small, medium, large, extra large screens where, um, low, medium, high density of pixels, and, and you're supposed to have density. It, it, it's a nightmare. Uh, anyway, we, we put our app in the, the store. It was available on 713 different uh, Android handsets out there. Uh, one of the handsets, which we didn't happen to have, the app crashed on that handset. The, the, the operative word is oops. <laughs> yeah. So <laughs> the, the, the three people who actually had that, that handset downloaded the app, crashed, Immediately left one star. This app sucks. It, it crashes. Wasn't one much. of them named Kadashi? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> so you know, right away that that pulled us down a full star rating, and then that whole that just translates into fewer downloads. So you know, luckily Android market's really great, and we could say, don't uh, let these people download anymore. That device download anymore. But man, stars, stars. Uh, I love them and I hate them. Um, well, you know, since we're basically a, a for hire shop, um, you know, we obviously we take you know great pride in our work, et cetera. But, um, and we, you know, we do have some of our own apps in the app store, but generally we you know are hired by someone else, and then they kind of take over that part of it. Uh, we do have long term arrangements where we do handle comments and and stuff like that. So, um, but you know, <coughs> primarily, uh, you know, I think I think that. As producers, you have to you know, kind of know, kind of go into it. Speaking about Android in particular, go in, go into it. Uh, you know, kind of just with uh, you know full disclosure. You know, we're not going to support as a company. We can't support 317 devices. Uh, you know, we have our list of Android devices that we will support. So if you want an Android app, this is our list. Okay, and it's it's all the major phones. It's all the you know HTCs and Samsungs and etc. But it, you know, some of the obscure ones we we basically They're won't. Also <coughs> yeah, as well. So. Yeah, so so that's kind of how we kind of try to manage that part of it. So um. I don't know. I, I will say a lot of times think about the fact that your users might be using your apps a lot on the weekends, which may be when you're trying not to work. But the truth of the matter is, you have to be because if something goes down, like one of your servers um, and your content, you know. Uh, it needs to refresh every day, and I don't know. I mean, people tend to get pissed off if they pay for something and it's not updating and it doesn't work. Um, so I guess that's an additional thing to think about too, in addition to you know, the yeah, that you don't want to think about customer customer service in terms of damage control. You want to be proactive about it. So 
At Guild, for example, we have uh, customer service on Twitter, which we see you know, completely taking off. We encourage users to actually contact our customer service department through Twitter. Um, and you know, I think users just kind of appreciate that kind of open feedback loop. Even if you can't fix everything, because honestly, we can. And even if you can't fix it in a month, because it takes two months or whatever, mm -hmm. just the fact that you feel like you've been heard makes a big difference. Other questions? All the way in the back. Yes, you, Don Me. Powell. Hey, how are you? Um, basically, I've heard speed, 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 keep it, keep it simple. But knowing that the web at this point is full of video, very difficult to get you know, fast and have a lot of it. And what do you see happening with apps? I mean, are we going to be inundated with a lot of video in apps, or are you going to stay away from it? So the question for those who didn't hear is, you've got a, a web full of video. Uh, are we going to see a, a, a tremendous amount of video in apps, or uh, do the panelists uh, think that that's um, uh, something that, that it should be used carefully? What, what, what are your thoughts? So we're seeing video grow every, every day uh, in, in terms of usage, and people actually um, you know, clicking and engaging. And I think a lot of that has to do with you know, 3G, 4G, and Wi-Fi everywhere. But you can also be really smart about you know, how you're encoding and different levels of encoding. And you can also do checking for, is this person on 3G? If they're, is, are they on 3G? Are they on Wi-Fi? If they're on 3G, send them this low bit rate, high bit rate. So you can do a lot of stuff to make it a better experience and keep it speedy, speedy, speedy for people. But you know, uh, well, that's just it. Just be smart about um, detecting connections and encoding. Yeah, I, I would just say the same thing. I mean, we're seeing more and more video being used. We're using more video. Pat Lafreda is a great example of that. And and uh, so, but yeah, again, using creating kind of internal controls to 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 manage that video content is is key. Same here. I you know I think that there's I work having worked in video and kind of the promise of video syndication across platforms. I think you're really gonna see it. I think. The issue, though, with apps is that you don't want to make a monster app that's like, you know, I don't know, a gig, <laughs> and expect people to download it. Um, especially, you know, it, it depends. If you're if you're doing stuff in the background, I guess background downloads, does that happen? Um, something else I wanted to say in a second, because you reminded me when you said something about push. Um, but I definitely see that uh, the video is, is proliferating. And just back to your question, he just got a push notification, someone just did, on yeah, their iPad. That is a great way to market and to keep your users aware when you send out new updates, new content. You know, they agree that they let you contact them that way. It's a good, good method to use. But don't abuse it. Yeah. So, so the, the example there from Guilt is Black Friday, 6 a.m. sales for those crazy people waiting in line at Walmart or whatever. Let's send out a push notification. No, that's going to go off on somebody's phone at 3 a.m. in the morning and wake them up. That's a really bad customer experience. And users don't know how to shut them off, so they just delete your app. So you want to like make sure that you're contacting them in a meaningful way. Everybody gets tons of emails, so, so you know exactly what that means. Just back to the video question, uh, of course video is growing. Maybe you just think a little bit about like context-specific video. So the shorter clips maybe on, uh, on handhelds and more mobile, mobile devices versus iPads at night. Um, and is it a guilt sale? Um, <laughs> <laughs> it's his wife. <laughs> Where are you? <laughs> um, yeah. Um, and even and creative uses of video. So something to think of like that. You know, we're thinking about our guilt is really short three-second video clips that just show you how the the, the the item, the article, actually moves. So video in kind of innovative, different ways. That was from Jeff's uh, wife, actually. Can you pick up flowers at the corner store? So, you know, it's a different kind of push notification. Other questions? I know they're out there. Really? Yes. Yeah, so, um, coming off of that video question, not all iPads are online all the time. Um, if you're creating an app that sometimes needs a connection but doesn't always, like you're doing something where you're actually interacting with your audience at a specific time, how much can you trust your audience to actually be connected at that time? So the question for those who didn't hear it is, you can't necessarily assume that every iPad or any mobile device is connected to a network, uh, whether it's Wi-Fi or it's a carrier network. I mean, 
we're actually getting pretty good connectivity for being essentially underground here. So what's the, the expectation level if you're producing those apps? I mean, how do you factor that into the mix, the offline versus online experience? So the, um, all, all the research shows that, that majority of um, people are using their iPads from 6 at night to midnight, to midnight at home on the couch with a Wi-Fi signal. The majority of iPads out there are Wi-Fi. Now, now that being said, the, um, the GM of my group takes the subway into work every day, and our iPad app didn't have offline built into it. So I, I think the majority of people, are, you know, they, they, they sort of understand that this is a, a sort of a mobile device and they need a connection. But if you're a GM in the subway and you want to read the, the, something on the new app, that, that's not the expectation. So um, we, we built in a lot of um, messaging saying, hey, you're, you're not connected to the internet. Why don't you go connect to the internet? And then we also built in some, <laughs> some uh, offline viewings like, so, like, hey, you're not connected to the internet and you haven't turned on offline viewing. Go to your settings and turn it on. It's something that we didn't put on automatically because uh, a lot of people are on data plans and it's a data hog. You're automatically just pulling down tons and tons of data and at the end of the month the person gets a bill for a thousand dollars. You don't want to be the app that caused that. So it's something that, that we just message and we make people proactively do themselves, including the GM. <laughs> um, I, you know, just, uh, I would go back to that, that whole, especially with the iPad, you know, it's, it really is, I mean, all the usage is backing up the fact that it's an inter entertainment device. Um, so I think if someone you know needs a Wi-Fi connection, they're going to understand that on that app. Now, you're talking about the iPhone is a little different. Um, you're going to want to access that on the go. You may want to you know if you have video, you know, and and you may want to you know have the video to be of a let's say not quite robust to quality. Um, if you want people to just get it on 3G, etc. So um, you know I think there, there's ways to kind of finesse that and manage that. I mentioned that there's this notion of background downloads. So for magazines, um, Apple just launched, launched something called the Newsstand, which is in essence a folder. And um, it's a way to kind of make everybody aware that there are magazines and newspapers out there, and they have their own little place on the, on the App Store. And one of the nice features about it is that it's very complicated on the back end with all the servers, but you can set it up so that um, if it's enabled to do this, there's push, there's push background downloads, so you push out the content, and if your user is on Wi-Fi, but they may not be using the iPad, all that content will be downloaded and ready for them the next time you know, the GM is in the subway, he doesn't have to worry about having to, uh, done that. Um, if your app contains video content, like many of our magazines do, then that'll all be there. Um, again, you want to be careful about you know, what you want to do in terms of baking video content into an app because it makes them huge. But if someone's sleeping and you send out a push, you know, of, of content, it downloads in the background while they're sleeping and it takes an hour, what do they care? When they get up in the morning, there's the content. So I think that those kinds of things um, that in, in improve the experience of the user and allows that, you know, sort of big video content, even if they're not connected to be there for them, that'll, that'll happen more and more. But yeah, to the point everyone else has made, mostly people are going to be on Wi-Fi. It's just be, sort of becoming much more ubiquitous, and I think um, you don't have to worry so much about, okay, am I going to cache this? Am I going to bake it in? Am I going to do progressive downloads? Things that we've been worrying about for a couple of years now. We still do have to think about those things, but I think it'll be less in the future. <laughs>